So uh, it, there's a long history of this, and we'll go, go through part of it today. And so the first thing that I always kind of point out here is that there is a face to cellular therapy now. Um, this used to just be something we did in a lab with a bunch of mice, but we're now treating patients, and we're seeing benefits in all these patients. And um, the first approval actually came uh, about a year ago when the FDA approved a product for uh, B, uh, ALL, so pediatric and young adult leukemia. And this is not only the first cellular immunotherapy that was approved, it was also the first gene therapy that was approved. And so it was an exciting time for the field. And I think what's really important here is that the patient here, her name's Emily Whitehead. She was the first pediatric patient infused with CAR T cells at the University of Pennsylvania. She was about four or five years old. She had uh, basically the worst kind of leukemia you can think of. It just never went away. And her parents took a last ditch effort and put her on a, this new, weird, crazy clinical trial. And here on the right uh, is the Emily Whitehead Foundation, which is she's now about six or seven years following her infusion. She, her leukemia is absolutely gone. Um, they, they were able, to, and within 30 days it disappeared and it has not come back. And so she was the very first pediatric patient uh, infused with the very first cellular immunotherapy approved by the FDA. And so she started a foundation as kind of representative of what we think the field is able to do for a lot of patients. Um, and also more importantly, here's a patient from MGH who uh, spoke to a news outlet um, about his experience with a CAR T cell from multiple myeloma. And so he had about, I think, six or seven prior lines of therapy for his myeloma um, and had progressive disease. And after his CAR T cells, he's had at least a year progression-free survival um, with, you know, I saw him walking around the hallways one day and he had gained about 30 or 40 pounds and uh, was feeling much better. So uh, he, he looked a little bit different, but as he put it, a little healthier than he was prior to uh, when we first met. So, it, you know, there, this, these are people that we're interacting and impacting here. So, not to go into too, too much science, but what is a chimeric antigen receptor? So, a chimera is a fusion of a few different things, and so chimeric is uh, how we describe what this is because it's basically that we're taking the outside of an antibody, so something like Herceptin, Cetuximab, Optivo, Ipilimumab, those types of drugs that you may hear of, which allow us to target things, and then we take that inside of a T-cell receptor, which is in all of our white blood cells, and that's kind of like the go switch. So if a T-cell receptor turns on, the T-cell knows to go and kill whatever it sees. And so what we do is we take the go switch, we combine it with the target, and we get a chimeric antigen receptor. So the outside's an antibody, the inside's a T-cell receptor, and the T-cells are now reprogrammed to go after whatever we want them to go after. And so this has been the power behind it. Um, it's a pretty complicated process, but basically, um, and I always tell patients, I, I can speak to this because I used to, as a medical student, donate my T cells once a month for about 200 bucks at Penn. Um, and it was, uh, so I, I, I've been hooked up to the machine, so I can, I can attest to what it's like. Uh, but um, basically, you get hooked up to something that looks like a dialysis machine, and it pulls your blood out, it takes your white blood cells out, and then it puts it back in. Um, but on the outside, you've kind of collected all the white blood cells. And so that's kind of what the patient sees. Those cells then get flown to one of many different manufacturing facilities around the country or even the world, and they get to what I call jazzed up. Um, this, is what, this is how we make the Ferraris. Um, and they have a whole different light types of technology that includes activating and using gene therapy to re-engineer them. It's a complicated process, but the end product is you have these new CAR T cells. And these new CAR T cells are now programmed to go after whatever we want them to go after, and in this case, cancer. So now that we've got these $400,000 Ferraris, um, we need to open the highway. So when you think about it, you're driving, if you just get a brand new car, and you get on 93 at 5 p.m., you're not gonna be able to do much with that brand new car. And so rather than getting stuck in traffic, we give a little bit of chemotherapy. Not high doses of chemotherapy, not chemotherapy that makes your hair fall out, but enough chemotherapy that actually opens up the highways in your veins. And so that allows the CAR, the CAR T cells to hit your veins and uh, you go a buck 80 uh, and get where they need to go and have all the nutrients and resources they need. So this helps them when they need to move along. Now, this is just a picture of where we started. So this is actually how we physically make it. And so this is kind of like a a shaker and it rocks around and the t-cells float around and that's kind of how they grow and they amplify and they grow over a thousand times and then this is what i call the new easy bake oven <coughs> approach where you can actually put the t-cells in put a couple of reagents program it and this is what the technology is allowing us to do where you know you put everything in it kind of all of a sudden pops out about 20 days later and you have your car t-cells so we've gone from having to be a very hands-on approach to something that's becoming automated so the technology is moving very very quickly 
Um, and I also have to give a credit to people here at MGH who are also part and behind the scenes. Um, and so you may see the doctors and nurses and research nurses and a bunch of other people, but there's also the, um, uh, the blood and transfusion service, the apheresis center. And so this is who actually collects the T cells for us and makes sure the patient's safe and does the assessments and kind of calculates how many cells they need and all of that. And so this is a whole other department that we work with, as well as the cell therapy and transplantation laboratory. So this is the lab that takes the cells once you get come off that machine and processes them and ships them and receives them from the company and thaws them and counts them and does everything to make sure it's safe and there's no contamination. And so it's a big behind the scenes effort that a lot of people don't see, but I wanna give credit to those two parts of the, the institution that are critical to making this happen. So what you happen is you zap the cells, you get a CAR T cell that's all of a sudden is expressed. Oh, there we go. And then it now knows that it needs to go and attack anything that has whatever we tell it to attack. In this case, in the most common case, it's a protein called CD19. And what that is, is going kind of back to the highway analogy, um, every exit sign kind of tells you where you are in the body, right? Or in the highway. So, you know, like I used to be exit eight on uh, 140 to get up to East Freetown. Um, and uh, that tells me where I need to go. Well, the CAR T cells have very similar, your body has very similar billboards that tells your immune system where to go and where the off ramps are. And one of those is called CD19, and that's what we're targeting in this case. So there actually are three approved indications. So these are the FDA approved indications. And this was the very first one. So um, as usual, there's always a big long name. This one's called Tisagen Leclusal, um, or Kimraya is uh, the, the brand name. And this is a survival curve. So this is why this is so exciting. So Emily Whitehead, her long-term survival at one year, based on where she was, would have been where this red star is today. So this was prior to CAR T cells. Most of these pediatric patients are at least in their fourth relapse. That means that they had their leukemia come back four times. That's including after bone marrow transplant. And after all is said and done, there are about a 60 to 80% one year survival rate, which is better than the 15 to 20% that we were looking at. So we're almost quadrupling this overall survival of this patient population, which I think is very, and this was our first go. So that means that at one year, if you had the worst kind of leukemia you can think of, you've got at least a 60 to 80% chance of being alive, which I think is pretty phenomenal given everything that we've had to go through to get there. Um, and that was approved in August of 2017. It's interesting, we value based in some situations, but you know, we're working, this is the first go, and we're working on ways of making this and working in financial and make it better and cheaper. And these are, these are where we're moving in the field and at MGH to try to make the next generation. So the next drug that was approved was something called Axicaptogene or Yescarta, and this was for adult lymphoma. So just like leukemia, this was for the relapse refractory, so the most aggressive of the aggressive lymphoma. And so this is lymphoma that had relapse or you can never get to go away in the first place or required a bone marrow transplant and then still came back. And so we really didn't have many other options for that. And what you can see here is that for the overall patient population, we're looking at about a 20% overall survival at 12 months with a median overall survival of six years. In this case, about 50% of patients after one year are still alive. And so again, we're taking, you know, what would otherwise have been probably you know, a 10 to 20% survival and we're at least doubling or tripling it um, in a very, very uh, resistant patient population. And so I, I bring that up only because these are the really, really tough patients to treat and we're gonna start treating patients earlier and earlier and earlier in their disease, which is what I, why I'm hopeful to think that maybe we'll cure more and more and more people. And so this is starting to happen now. Um, that was also approved in October of 2017. And then they got another approval for Kimraya and the same lymphoma indication. Um, but these are all showing similar activity across the board. So it's very exciting to see things like that. And that was also approved in May of 2018. Um, and I think we, we had the claim to fame of being the first, at least, East Coast center to have infused one of the first products. Um, I'm not sure about globally. We may have been tied with some place in Florida. But uh, it, it's exciting because we're making sure that we're on the forefront of doing this. So, it takes an army to do this, and this is just kind of the cellular therapy service that we're trying to build here. Um, and there's a whole lot of things that have to happen for this to go smoothly. And so we're looking at the FDA and a lot of other organizations who are monitoring this very, very closely. So if you get a treatment like this, you actually have to be followed for 15 years. So we have to report data to the FDA for 15 years since it is a gene therapy. So there's a lot of regulatory stuff we gotta do. 
There's a lot of administrative and finance. People have to stay within Mass General for four weeks after they get their T cells. That's not easy to do in Boston. And so we're working on getting patients housing and support through the pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies. And so that's a lot of work. And we have a, a big financial group and administrative group working on that. There's a the clinical care. We're going to talk about some of the toxicities in a second. Um, so you need medical specialists like ICU doctors, like nephrologists, pulmonologists, uh, neurology. You need social work to help the families as they're going through the process. You need pharmacy to make sure they have the special medications on board. You need the nursing staff and advanced practitioners to know how to care for these patients. You need the outpatient infrastructure to see these patients quickly. Um, and then there's also a whole different education in uh, the BTS and CTL, as I had mentioned, so the, the apheresis and cell therapy lab. And then you also need the research infrastructure to run the clinical trials to get the new approvals. And the stuff that I'm really excited about is the stuff that MGH is doing ourselves. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So overall, um, this is the number of infusions. So this is the number of patients who have been infused over the last year or so. In 2016, we had about 10 infusions. And as you can see in the first part of 2017 or so, we had a couple. But around two th the last quarter of 2017, we saw an uptick. In 2018, we saw another uptick. And not only that, but we're already treated about another five patients just this quarter alone, about another 15 to 20 research patients just this quarter alone. And we have another seven or so scheduled for Q, uh, Q3 of standard of care, but on the 15 to 20 of research. So I'm expecting this curve to continue to increase pretty rapidly, which is exciting for me. because I, It means we're getting the, these new therapies to patients and we're being successful with it. And so we're seeing a lot of growth and that's exciting. It's a long process, but basically what we're doing within this is we're building the infrastructure to see patients, consent patients, screen patients, get financial approval for patients, make sure that they have all the testing and uh, other doctors involved to make sure it's safe, to get those cells collected, manufactured, get chemotherapy, get admitted, get infused, and eventually get discharged, and then get followed up for those 15 years. And so we're having one big group of people to kind of come together and try to do this, currently through bone marrow transplant, but eventually as a service of its own. And so we're building this infrastructure now to prepare for the things that are coming in the future, as I'm hopeful and I predict that as we get other indications, this is going to become a more and more powerful and popular tool to be using for patients. So what are the toxicities? Um, the big toxicities are something called cytokine release syndrome and neurotox. Um, and then B cell aplasia, which you don't have to go too much into, but it's somewhat expected because when we target the bad B cells that are leukemia lymphoma, we also have some bystanders who are the good B cells. And so we can deal with that. And that's something we kind of expect. But so without going into too much of the science behind it, CRS or cytokine release syndrome, and this is why we need such specialty level care and why we need so many doctors on board and why the FDA is watching so closely is because it can be something like the flu. So you may have some aches, some pains, you may not be hungry, you just may not feel well. That's great, you may have some high fevers. That's, the, that's low grade CRS. High grade CRS means that you could be in the ICU, you may need a breathing machine to help, you may need to be on dialysis temporarily. But these are things that we know how to treat and that are reversible in most cases. And so we're very careful to watch patients very closely and to provide the supportive care they need as inpatients to do this. And then neurotox is kind of a weird one. And this is what I actually warned family members about the most, because if you do get this as a patient, you're probably not going to remember it um, because patients wake up and they go, what happened? And it's really funny because they go from completely asleep or really agitated to awake and um, uh, one of the patients we had uh, actually um, could, was having a hard time talking, and that was her manifestation of aphasia. And the first thing she said, because her son, for some reason, was totally comfortable with this, because I told him about it, he expected it, there was no concerns. The first thing she said, because he kept teasing her the entire time, was shut up. And so she woke up, she said shut up to her son, and then she was chatting thereafter. Um, so, but he was happy to take it because his mom was awake and, and doing better. Um, and that was actually our very first patient treated, and I'll show you some of our success rates. So uh, we can skip that. So there, these things occur very commonly. So about 94% of CRS and about 90% of neurotoxicity, all different degrees and amounts, but they're pretty common across all the different products. So this is why this is such a specialty type of therapy, very much like bone marrow transplant, because these things are rather unique to this and some of the other types of immunotherapies. So this is, this is a response. So this is the first patient we ever treated uh, with the first lymphoma drug that was approved uh, back in October. And um, this patient was infused around uh, end of November. Um, and this is her lymphoma right here. So that was her disease. So she had relapse. She had two lines of chemotherapy. 
and then she had a bone marrow transplant, and then her disease still came back. And this was, this was her entire chest wall, which is all lymphoma. Within 30 days of getting the treatment, you can, there is no more lymphoma whatsoever. And I just got off the phone with her because I wanted to congratulate her on her six month scans that were probably about two or three weeks ago, which at six months, which is kind of a magical number for this treatment in, in lymphoma, she still doesn't have disease. And so she wants to come back to MGH to say hi to some of the people who took care of her and to meet some of the people who are involved. Um, because she wants to say thank you and to, you know, especially for the nurses who helped her get through all of this. So it's, like I said, it takes an army. So let's talk about what we're doing, what's new. Um, so these are the number of clinical trials that we have going on in the United States that are, that are basically chimeric antigen receptors, so anything that's a CAR T cell. And this tends to correlate with all the big centers, so Seattle, uh, City of Hope, MD Anderson, University of Pennsylvania, New York, Dana-Farber, and us. Uh, and my goal is to get this number to increase rapidly. I want to have the, the most trials available to patients um, of any place in the United States, and we're working on it. Um, and overall, so when I started in 2010, when no one really believed this was going to work, there were less than five clinical trials in the United States, or in the globe, I should say, in the entire world. And as of June 8th, there are 281 clinical trials of cellular therapy. So in the last eight years or so, it just has kind of exponentially increased the number of trials and will likely continue to do so in the future. Um, and then here are some examples of clinical trials and diseases we're treating. So we have trials in multiple myeloma. That, that's another product that's showing a lot of success. Lymphoma with adult leukemia. We're treating patients with adult leukemia. With hepatocellular carcinoma, so a type of liver cancer. Um, patients who have lung cancer. Um, and then this is an interesting study that's opening up shortly that actually doesn't depend, it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. So you know when you, when you have lymphoma or breast cancer, you go to a lymphoma doctor or a breast cancer doc. This trial doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. All you have to have is a specific kind of billboard of that sign that I mentioned on your, t on your tumor, and we can treat you with it. And so some of this is moving towards a disease agnostic approach. And then finally, as I said, that we're trying to move these therapies up in, in, in the line of therapy. So rather than after you relapse with transplant, what about we just do it instead of transplant, save you, save you the hassle. And so we're starting to open up trials that's going to be a phase three study to compare CAR T cells versus transplant. Um, and then just to kind of give you some, some uh, since we've been talking a lot about blood cancers, we're going to talk about this, uh, this quick slide on solid tumors, where we've been able to use cellular therapy to cure patients who have had synovial sarcoma. So a metastatic sarcoma patient um, is, after 100 days, still doesn't have a disease. And one that's really exciting because it's, you know, a pretty scary disease is glioblastoma, or a GBM, if anyone's heard of that. And there have been cases of patients who have responded and been cured with cell therapy with GBMs. So again, this is working for heme malignancies. Solid tumors are a little bit behind, but we're going to get there, and that's our goal. Um, and these are just other clinical trials where we're looking at prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, these are all things that have been tried and we're continuing to work on. So it's coming. And so what is MGH doing? Um, so that's just kind of what I showed you, the cellular therapy service, but there's a whole other infrastructure that's being set up right now. That's the overall cellular immunotherapy program. And what that's meant to do, and, oh, I'm sorry. And these are just a picture, and this is Marcella Moss, who's overseeing that program. And this is her lab, and I'm kind of standing in the back. And Brian Choi, who's a neurosurgical uh, resident here, who's doing, who's working on some of the brain cancer stuff. Um, Irena Scarfo, she's a PhD from Italy. We actually have a very diverse lab, so we have people from Colombia, we have people from Italy, we've got people from um, China, we've got people. I'm just trying to think where everyone is. South Africa, we have patients or, 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 um, from Russia. So it's a very international lab, which I think is very exciting. And we're here to ask, why do these toxicities happen? How can we treat them or prevent them? How do we you know, treat patients who may have their disease come back after CAR T cells? Can we make it better with combining it with other types of drugs? How do we get it into solid tumors and how do we make it cheaper? And then what's the next generation going to be? Um, and I'm excited to say, don't have to worry about the details, but basically that we've created our own version of a CAR T cell that we're going to be bringing in for B and T cell lymphomas. Um, and even may have some role in AML. And so we're, we're bringing that and we're manufacturing and it takes years to get there, but these are basically what we have now with CAR T cells. This is what we made and we think it has some broader applications to other diseases. Um, and so we're, we're, that's in the works. Um, and just to show you some key players, uh, again, I'm not, this is not inclusive by any means, but this is the, the main steering committee that we're doing for the cell therapy service, BTS and CTTL, neuro-oncology is involved, the ICU director, infectious disease, uh, cardio-oncology. And I, I just want to point out that most of these people that I'm mentioning here in the other specialties are actually 
cardio-oncology experts, neuro-oncology experts. And so something nice about MGH is not only do we have amazing neurology and cardiology, but they're also so subspecialized that we have cardio-oncology. So cardiologists who focus specifically on cardiology and cancer patients, or neurology and cancer patients. And so it's, I think, a unique experience and opportunity to have to bring all those people together. So at that, I'll just open it up for some questions. Or someone come with the microphone. Oh, you get the microphone. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the um, indicators. My husband was a multiple myeloma patient, and um, when, so this was like late 2016, early 2017, mm -hmm. so it was really on the onset. He was a patient of Dr. Rajay. Mm -hmm. And when they tested him, he wasn't a candidate. And so it was something about an indicator that he didn't have. So, yeah, could so, so remember how we talked about the billboards and I said CD19? The one for the trial I think they were trying to screen your husband for was a protein called BCMA, which is a different marker. Um, Early on, we weren't sure if the level of BCMA, so how big or how bright that marker was, was important. Um, and we've gotten a little bit more lax with that over time with different trials. But initially, back at that point in time, we were only we were expecting the really, really bright people. or That, that was the indicator that we were looking at. Um, and we're starting to understand whether that's important or not and whether we can treat patients safely without having that bright, bright marker. But I think that's what, what was, uh, Dr. Raju was referring to at that time. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, recurrence. Are there ways now to do blood tests to measure markers as CD19 for recurrence? Yeah, so it's actually not even a specialty blood test we're having to do. We can do something called flow cytometry that looks at all those markers on the blood or on the tissue, or we can do PET scans and do biopsies. And so we can pretty easily look for that marker to come back. Um, but we're also interested in finding if that marker isn't there and the disease still comes back, why? And how do we treat it? And on top of that, if the disease comes back, can we add other drugs back in to try to reinvigorate or re-excite the T cells to start doing their job again? And so this is something, you know, the numbers of, you know, 40 to 80%, depending on the disease of CR rates I'm referring to, are patients who just get those T cells. We're hoping to combine that with other things to increase that number, and if the disease comes back. Now there's even, not to get too technical, but there's even a therapy coming down the road where you take a pill and it turns your T cells on, and you stop taking the pill and the T cells go away so you don't get toxicity, and then your cancer may come back, you take the pill again, the T cells come back on. And so we can actually control that and kind of dial in what we want the T cells to do. So we're getting there. Yes, as a uh, pancreatic cancer survivor, um, I've been following this a little bit, and I understand that pancreatic cancer is particularly resistant to immunology-type approaches. And I'm just wondering if you could mention why. Is it the stroma? Is it uh, something about the cancer itself? That's actually a phenomenal question. Um, I think what you're referring to is so the tumor microenvironment is what we call it. And so the thing with blood cancers are that blood cancers are usually T cells are part of the blood. B cells are part of the blood, and they're used to interacting. You know, that's kind of what they do normally. And so when it comes to blood cancers, it may be a little bit easier. But solid tumors, I think there are a lot other things that are need to be addressed. And so CAR T cells alone for solid tumors may not be enough, but CAR T cells plus pembrolizumab or Keytruda may be helpful, and they're looking at that. CAR T cells plus uh, certain types of tyrosine kinase inhibitors may be good or other immunomodulating types of drugs. So we've got to, I think for each solid tumor, we've got to find out what the Achilles heel is or what makes it so resistant. Um, and in those situations, you know, try to exploit that. But that may be patient specific, it may be disease specific. Um, but like I said, the, the success hasn't been as strong in solid tumors, but this is still the Model T of CAR T cells. Um, and we're still, you know, we have years and decades of work to do to get it to, you know, maybe even put chemotherapy out of business. I guess a little confusing about the CD19, but CD19 was involved, and it was blutumumab. Mm -hmm. 
and within 12 weeks, full remission. Um, but it didn't last. Mm -hmm. what, uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Because of your response so quickly, does that make you a better candidate because you passed the, the cell mm -hmm. um, disbursement, mm -hmm. the high fevers, the neurological um, testing, mm -hmm. and went through that for the trial that was about 14 weeks? Um, so would that make you a can if you were a candidate for the CAR T cells, would that improve your chances because you've already gone through a similar I, I mean, type of treatment? treatment. Yes. Yeah, so the, the therapy I think you're referring to are called bites or blenotumumab or blenocyte is the specific drug. Um, and that similarly engages T cell like CARs, but just in a different way. Um, a lot of the patients who had been treated on these clinical trials with CAR T cells had already received blenotumumab. And so I think those data that I presented that show the response rates were pa that included patients who had previously treated blen. So I don't think that relapse after blenitumumab really matters as much for CAR T cells, except in the situation in which that relapse occurred because they kind of cut the, the, the tumor cut that antigen or that billboard off, and so then the T cells wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but it doesn't, uh, you know, other than that, it shouldn't really predict what your response is going to be to CAR T cells. So. It doesn't help to say that you may not have um, drastic uh, neuro, neuro syndrome. Oh, you know? so for toxicities. Yeah, um, things like that, that you would be a better it's candidate. Hard, it's hard. I can't exactly say. I, you know, we, I can kind of speculate, but we really don't have enough data to say whether if you had those toxicities with blenocyte, would you have those toxicities with CAR T cells? Okay. They're very similar, and you'd probably have the potential of having that, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not like 100%. And will you have to be in remission? If you have a constant, you know, pattern of treatment, so maybe a year it's back treatment because you're saying you want to catch, so you, catch it easy, earlier. Yeah, so we try to treat people as early as possible. Um, we don't, you don't have, actually, you sh we don't like people to be in remission if we're doing CAR T cells because we want something for the CAR T cells to go after for now. Okay. Um, but, you know, I'll just emphasize the reason why we're doing CAR T cells is that we think it's a curative one-shot therapy. And so the point is that you don't have to have any more, you know, lines of therapy thereafter. So that's the goal. Anything else? I um, actually just received CAR, CAR T cell therapy, um, and 28 days out, I had a PET scan and I'm in remission. So congratulations! Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything you guys are doing. It makes a huge difference. Um, while I was inpatient and after receiving their infusion, they did blood work every four hours. And I was just curious, uh, I had gotten 15 million T cells and how much are you concerned with the, you know, every four hour blood work or with all the blood work that's done, you know, removing any of the T cells that you just put in and kind of how that would have, you know, affect the efficacy of the treatment. Yeah, so um, I, I'm sorry that we were taking blood every four hours, but is it probably for a reason? <laughs> no, totally. But, um, you know, we're trying to, part of that is we're trying to understand what we actually even have to look for in the first place to know what's going on. Um, I wouldn't be as worried about removing too many T cells because when those T cells went in your body, those 15 million or so probably became 15 billion. Um, and so they expand over a thousand fold. So, um, it's kind of like a drop in the bucket overall, but, um, th but the reason why we're taking on that blood is to understand how we can predict those any types of toxicities, make the therapies better, and over time start pulling back on how frequently we have to check. But again, congratulations. I'm excited to hear that. Thank you very much. Maybe one more question if we can. I think there's a woman has her hand raised up here. And, and Matt, are you going to be able to... Are you going to be I'll, I'll be here with the break, yep. Okay, that's great. So if you have questions still, um, as we move on to our next speaker, Matt will be available. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. Hi, I'm curious about the front end of the system. It sounded like um, the cell, the blood work goes through um, a process of being sent away. And I'm curious about the, who makes the machinery, how much it costs, mm -hmm. how all that stuff works at the front end. Could it be shorter? Uh, yes. Um, it's a 
the manufacturing process is about 17 to 22 days for what we call vein to vein. So the blood comes out and then the T cells go back in is anywhere from 17 to 22 days. Um, we try to make that as short as possible. Areas that we could actually improve on that are areas with we have to do testing for the FDA. That takes a couple days that we're working with the FDA to improve. The machinery is somewhat specific to the company and it depends on where it's going. So it goes to California for a company called Kite, and we're in New Jersey for a company called New Jersey, uh, and, uh, called Novartis. Um, but that turnaround time, that same day shipping, same, same day arrival, it's highly, highly regulated. Um, and we try to get as quickly as possible. But there are things that we're doing to try to make manufacturing faster, maybe say five to 10 days. Um, and we're looking into ways of maybe having things that are more off the shelf. And so rather than having to manufacture it for every specific patient, we're manufacturing a whole bunch that we can use in a lot of different people. And so th that's a whole different type of immunology we're trying to get around. But you know, the, the goal, my dream would be that you come in, you have a diagnosis, we make the decision, Two days later, we're going into the freezer, taking a vial of CAR T cells and giving them to you and having the same types of effects. Okay, great, thanks. I'll let Dr. Ryan speak. Oops.